So today I want to talk about uh, how do we be prepared for the next pandemic. Um, there's been lots of them. Um, I am I will be 52 years old next week, and I have seen multiple pandemics in my lifetime, including HIV being a big one, COVID being ones, but we can all remember Zika when Ebola broke out. We can remember influenza, swine flu. Uh, we can remember um, a whole bunch of others, including uh, microbial resistance, which is on, on the rise at the moment. Um, but today uh, I wanted to ask, what does a potential pandemic have to do with the price of eggs? I uh, hope you all remember that back in the spring, just there was just crazy cost of a dozen eggs was just out of control and actually is still continuing to be quite high. Um, but also that uh, in French, uh, in France, the, the rooster is a sign of vigilance because if there is trouble, it crows. Um, so the two go together. Um, I, as Dr. Parker said, I'm the director of our UCSD Prepare Institute, and that stands for the Pandemic uh, Response to Emerging Pathogens, Antimicrobial Resistance, and Equity as our group. Um, and our vision here at UCSD is to partner with local scientific community to be a global leader in preparedness and response for emerging and evolving infectious threats. And this is because San Diego is the front door to the Pacific Rim, Central and South America. It hosts a large military presence and a port and is the busiest land border crossing in the world. It is a national port of entry for many infectious threats and is well positioned with its industry, academia, and biotech for partnerships to really be at the forefront for detection um, and uh, to thwart these threats. Um, UCSD is a great place for it because we are a global academic powerhouse producing high impact and prolific research. We boast considerable uh, other types of research and education and training resources. All of those will be needed for such preparedness. And we have a proven track record of leading regional, national, and global efforts to prevent, treat, and improve outcomes for infectious threats. And we can just name a few of HIV, my, microbial resistance, COVID-19, and even MPOX. We were the ones that pushed the NIH to start a trial on MPOX as soon as it came out. Um, and we led one of the big vaccine efforts um, to get people vaccinated and to learn uh, how we can vaccinate for MPOX. So here's our family. Um, you recognize a lot of these. We have the schools of medicine, public health, pharmacy, um, CPS, engineering, SIO, uh, biology, et cetera. And then there's lots of centers, including a lot of those in infectious diseases, such as CHARM around resistance, IPATH around phages, CIFAR with HIV, also the ACTRI for clinical trials, but Milk Institute, Gender Equi Equity and Health, but also lots of programs and cores. And we have tons of partners across the MESA, um, including the Vetner Institute, La Jolla Institute, and Scripps Research, trying to come together to really tackle this big problem. And how big is this problem? <laughs> I just pulled um, some uh, travel notices affecting international travelers, and these are still up to date in terms of there's COVID-19 running around. Even here in San Diego right now, we're hitting uh, still at a rel relatively high rate coming off our uh, late summer surge, um, but there's also Japanese encephalitis in Australia, uh, floods in Nigeria, but there's global polio, um, everything that you can imagine out there. So what is an outbreak? What happens when an outbreak goes on? But here's one that we responded to in terms of the PREPARE Institute. So in August of last year, uh, there was a state of emergency um, here in California for MPOX. Um, San Diego County followed that uh, very closely. We were ones that were pushing to have that happen. Um, and then the US uh, declared a health emergency around MPOX. So what did PREPARE do? Well, we joint got a joint program together with uh, CIFAR and PREPARE uh, to put in some developmental funds. And then we also launched, uh, helped launch a randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, for a drug called Ticoveramat that was supposed to be, that was developed for smallpox. And since MPOX and smallpox were similar, uh, we helped launch that trial. And it's actually still going. It's called STOMP, a study of uh, Ticoveramat for human monkeypox uh, virus infections. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we also, did a trial to study the immunogenicity of dose reduction strategies because there wasn't enough 
vaccine on the smallpox side um, for mpox. And uh, so using dose reduction to see if it actually uh, could help spread out the doses that we actually had for uh, mpox. And like what we did with the Petco Park, we worked with the county to set up vaccination sites. This is actually from COVID, but we did the same thing for mpox. And then um, I'll just stop I'll just real quickly there, just to give you some updates. The, the treatment trial with Ticoviramed is still going, but the open label component of that trial looks that it did actually decrease the levels of mpox in people, but we don't have a good idea of whether or not it actually decreased symptoms. So that, that work is still ongoing. Um, the other one with the vaccination did look like that uh, you could dose reduce the amount of uh, vaccine needed and still cause protection. What was interesting in that trial and what we're still struggling with is that the smallpox vaccination works great. Like you get a smallpox vaccination, you're basically protected for life. But if you get this smallpox vaccination for mpox, you are not protected. It looks like the vaccine wanes in about a year and that people, uh, even after they got infected, infected, even though they got vaccinated with mpox, would, could later get infected with mpox. And that happened in June of this year. And we're still trying to sort out what the immunologic correlates of that is. And it didn't matter if it was dose reduced or not. Um, it probably, if I had to guess, it probably has to do with that the smallpox vaccine is not exactly perfect for mpox, even though these are both pretty conserved viruses and big and DNA and bulky and our, our immune system should be able to handle them, but it doesn't look to be the case for mpox. So we've had a bunch of other funded projects. Um, we haven't been um, lazy. We've been going after a bunch of stuff and this is one called PIP, which is Predictive Intelligence for Pandemic per, um, Prevention. This is led by Eli, Ravi, and Camille. And this was a goal to transform society's ability to forecast pandemic scale events um, by the National Science Foundation. We also did a New Frontiers grant with Dan Werb and Stephanie Strathy. Um, it's a Canadian uh, government mechanism, and it's preventing morbidity and mortality among those who inject drugs in post-pandemic era. And we've all seen uh, the the news reports and the data showing that there's just enormous amounts of overdose and drug use during the pandemic, and we'll call it post-pandemic, but it's it's been quite the ordeal. And then there's also the Jumbo Phage uh, project with David Pride and Chip Schooley and Stephanie Strathy, um, looking at the emerging pathogens initiatives and using bacteriophages, which fall under what we're trying to do and prepare. Uh, to prepare us for uh, what happens with antimicrobial resistance. Uh, there's also the RADx program with Lucilla and Eli and David Pride around diagnostics on that side. And then also, of course, uh, Rob Knight and Christian Anderson with the uh, wastewater detection and return to learn, et cetera. So they're a big part of our group as well. And then Resilient Shield is a new uh, funded program and it's a network of outbreak of data integration and modeling to support rapid health action. And this is a CDC funded project. You might've seen this, it just was announced just a couple of weeks ago, uh, but our uh, university is partnering with the county and other, ex other UC campuses and Los Alamos and University of Washington, really focusing on our modeling and forecasting expertise um, to look for other future um, infectious disease threats. So I'm really excited about that. That's new and that's gonna be good. So that's that's kind of the history or what's been going on with the Prepare Institute. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what UC San Diego can do in the future. And it's all about building capacity. Uh, we are a university and so we teach stuff. I am a professor and I'm supposed to profess stuff. And uh, that's one of our big goals in the next iteration for the Prepare Institute is really around education and students. And then the next big thing is about space and building up uh, ability to do the research that we need to do and to do the education that we need to do, but also to develop the scientists that will be able to face these upcoming threats and the science and then of course improve health. Um, one of the big fallouts of what we've noticed in the COVID pandemic has been burnt out and a lack of trainees wanting to study infectious diseases and to go in to this particular area of research. 
And here's just a really interesting um, thing, but there's uh, limits of the Fauci effect. So at the beginning, it was like, oh yeah, we all need to go be the hero and go into infectious diseases. Um, but we noticed that in 2022, uh, the rate of applicants going into infectious diseases absolutely plummeted. The same thing was seen actually also in emergency medicine. And um, people called that the uh, uh, limits of the Fauci effect. Now there is this sort of like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that. I did this in my training. That was horrible. I don't want to have that experience again. So there's a lot of uh, uh, I worry that there will be less infectious disease physicians in the future because of the COVID pandemic. And along those lines, um, where politics and science don't mix because of probably some retribution on the Congress side, uh, NIAD, which is an Infectious Disease Division Institute from the NIH, had its funding cut um, 20% for 2023 in the latest budget side. So that doesn't, doesn't bode well for us being prepared for the next pandemic. Uh, but other things that we can do on the prepare side, um, here is one of our education components that we work that we just had. Uh, well, not just actually in January of this year, we had uh, Tom Frieden from former director of the CDC come and give a talk um, at our institute, and we are now planning for a larger NIH funded conference um, later this fall. Probably looks like beginning of this winter um for prepare so if y'all are interested we'll send out the announcement please attend these are quite been quite fun other ones we have of course a monthly seminar series where we showcase uh various things that's going along going on in the mesa around uh pandemic preparedness including a lot of our friends uh like dr borquez and dr mazze of course and then uh we've been trying to funnel more money into research in terms of development grants and basically partnering with friendly people like the Milk Institute and CIFAR um, to really put things together, including like MPOX and milk research with COVID, et cetera. And there's been a lot of good grants, I'm sorry, good papers coming out of this. And hopefully the next stage is to get some good grants for these early stage investigators who have um, won these development awards. Another big one that we see that's going to be quite a big issue going forward is space. Um, there isn't a lot of high containment research, and that's usually called biosafety level three um, or select agent research um, capacity here at UCSD. And we noticed this during COVID for sure. We felt the crunch. There was just not enough uh, capacity, literal uh, real estate space to be able to do this high containment research. We had tons of researchers who had tons of great ideas, but we just didn't have the ability to test all those good ideas to make treatments and research, et cetera. So we've had, so we've gone after to try to increase this capacity in, around space here at UCSD with going to Congress and et cetera, to really focus on getting uh, expansion of our current facilities to be able to do um, state-of-the-art research there. And it's expensive, so we're going to really need some help. And here's a good example. Um, on the other side, not just doing research in labs, but what about the clinical space? What happens if somebody drops in at UCSD with Ebola or they come to the county here with Ebola? What do, what do we do with them? Well, we know that it can happen because it, it happened in 2014 um, when it was dropped into Texas. Um, but we're actually a much bigger uh, city with a much bigger port and presence where these infectious diseases can come in. And we just don't have in, um, the clinical uh, containment capacity that I think we would want. Um, we have some, right? We were the ones that did the quarantine. We helped uh, with the quarantine site at Miramar Air Station um, when the first uh, patients with COVID came on that cruise ship. And they came to San Diego because we had the relationships with the Navy. They also had uh, big relationships at UCSD along with Francesca Torriani to make sure everything was safe and contained. Um, but that was a special circumstance. We need to think broader on how we can uh, do this on a better scale. So one of the big desired uh, things that we'd like is to have a Hillcrest enhancement around being able to see um, patients with potentially um, pandemic threats. Why are the prices of eggs so high? Well, um, 
last February, nearly 58 million birds have lost, uh, been lost due to avian flu. And it's the deadliest ever outbreak of avian flu and the worst uh, animal health disaster in US history. It's impacted every single uh, poultry that we eat um, and the eggs, uh, the egg laying hens in 47 states. And it's believed that about 10% uh, of uh, hens have died from avian flu. And this is influenza. And if you don't remember anything from this talk about all the stuff that we're doing in the Prepare Institute, I just want you to remember this one thing. And it's a good tenet from infectious disease in general. And as a virologist, this is what I live with. Uh, what doesn't kill you uh, mutates and tries again. And that is where we are currently with avian flu. It is mutating to learn how it can infect other things, not just birds. That includes mammals. Um, and that's really what uh, I, I worry about the most at the moment is what is the next pandemic? I, if somebody asked me in 2019 what I thought the next pandemic would be, I would say this one. I would have said avian flu. Uh, I was wrong, um, but I do still think that this one is coming. And it is it is very worrisome because now it is starting to creep into uh, mammals and not just uh, infect mammals, but to be able to spread from mammals. Um, and the other big thing that we have to worry about is that it kills half of uh, the mammals it infects and specifically humans. So it has infected humans um, and it's killed half of them. Uh, the kill rate with COVID, uh, even before Omicron was relatively low. And we can, we can talk about all the different numbers there are, um, but Delta, you know, wasn't uh, double digits for sure, right? It was somewhere in the very low one digits and maybe even below 1%, depending on where you look at. And Omicron is definitely less than that, um, especially with lots of the higher rates of vaccination than um, people who've already been infected and have existing immune responses. But avian flu is a whole nother beast. And we really need to be able to get ready. So this is something that I'm pushing and trying to get our, uh, use, our campus involved with so that we'll be ready for it next time. And one of this is around space. And we need a different kind of space. With COVID, we didn't have to have what's called select agent space, but this time we do um, for avian flu with super high containment facilities uh, to re, um, remodel our current BSL-3 laboratory is around $200,000. So I am going around asking for that. Um, the other one is for long-term is we really need to create a state-of-the-art BSL-3 that has select agents so we can do uh, more research rather than just small amounts of containment for research. We are also looking at the, perhaps the uh, VA that we have here uh, would be interested in helping us uh, with that and creating a select agent space. There's not a BSL-3 at all in the VA system across the nation, and I think we have the the capacity and the expertise here to really push that along. So I'm hoping for that. I think that is something uh, that would be direly needed. I, I can't imagine that if we were faced with avian flu right now, how we would do anything to respond because we have no space to be able to do so. So our potential partners is how we transform um, and how we prepare for pandemics. And that goes everything from public to private to philanthropy to get those funds to be able to do stuff. Um, and then I wanted to end on uh, COVID a little bit. Uh, one is uh, don't forget your vaccines. This is vaccine season. Um, the three that if you qualify for RSV, I think you should get it. The same thing for flu and the same thing for COVID. You can get them all at the same time. I, I am a wuss. I do not get them all at the same time. So I, I would like, I am going to get uh, flu, uh, COVID first and then flu. Um, but I do recommend everybody getting their vaccine because last winter, this was what they called the triple-demic, right? All three of these viruses were circulating. We saw multiple patients in the hospital who even had two at the same time. It was just uh, horrendous. And uh, 
Maybe they'll be the same this year, but you, we have vaccines for all these. So please get yours if you qualify. Um, here's our daily hospital admissions. And I just wanted to point out that we did, we are, this is from late September, um, going up with a pretty high uh, rate of COVID. And this is our daily hospital uh, admissions, most of them among uh, older people. And this is going to continue to happen every year. And basically this is because our immune responses and memory, immune and memory, uh, waiting as we get older. And I just think that COVID is not going to go away. So we're always going to see these upticks. What's interesting is it looks like COVID is going to have a double wave every year, late summer, and then back into the winter, um, which is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, but vaccines help. Um, so, but the problem is that uh, it's been very low for our, for our booster. So our primary series around 70% of people um, for the total population, definitely good in the older population, but look at the booster rate, even among the older group, it's around 43%. So that's unfortunate. Um, other things to remember, uh, nobody's gonna get out uh, without getting COVID. I think it's there's just so much of it going around and it's always gonna be here. We can't get rid of it. Uh, it's You can't keep dodging that bullet forever. And if you do get infected, um, also the vaccine doesn't really help from getting prevention of infection. It just helps you survive the infection that you get. But the other one is don't forget about uh, therapies. And we have three therapies at the moment, including Paxo Paxlovid, Remdesivir, and Molnupiravir. Uh, they do have some common side effects. But um, as I told my parents that uh, it, when they got COVID, they still had to take the medication, even if they didn't like taste of it. That is my dad um, telling me that he will never take that again. And I said, yes, you will, um, if you have to. But um, hopefully there will be some new ones coming along, which we are trialing uh, at the moment here at UCSD and other places um, that maybe the next generation of these medications will do better. But right now, just don't forget about it. If you get COVID, get your treatment. Um, they do prevent people from um, dying. Um, and then I just want to leave with one other quote is that for of all the forms of inequality and injustice in healthcare is the most shocking, uh, the injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And the reason uh, this is my quote uh, that I try to remember is that this is what we saw over and over again in the, in the COVID pandemic, um, that there was just huge amounts of uh, inequality. Um, even among the neighborhoods in San Diego, even among the patients within UCSD. And um, it's because infectious disease loves vulnerable people. That's gay men with uh, HIV and MPOX and COVID with the black and brown communities here in San Diego um, just got hit hard. And we have to keep that in mind. And that's the reason that the last E in the PREPARE Institute is around equity. Okay. And then I wanted to leave a lot of time so that we could have a good uh, Q&A, if that's okay, Dr. Parker. Sounds great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Smith. Um, we ask that you raise your hand and or put a question in the chat. So I see we have a hand raised. Um, Joel Dimsdale, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Thanks, Barbara. And thanks, Davey. It's, it's just great to catch up with you again. And to see all the good work that you're doing. Now, you know there's a but coming, don't you? Um, so, you know, it's a wonderful interdisciplinary effort, but there's something missing there. And I don't know whether um, you haven't found collaborators at UCSD or whether you're just maxed out on all these endeavors. But certainly one of the things that, has, that struck me was the debacle in terms of communication of information, um, political science uh, of communication, computer screening of information. God, we need that so badly. And I, I really worry uh, uh, if we're not pursuing that. And I'm wondering whether you've had a handshake from anybody who's really focusing on the, the communication issues in future pandemics. 
Thank you, Dr. Demzel. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I should have put it in here, but we have a very large component around facing misinformation um, within PREPARE. It is, it's always tricky, but I'm gonna tell a story. So we have this group called Resilient. Um, and in that group, it was part of coming out of PIP. It actually uses a thing called serious games. I don't know if anybody knows about serious games, but these are basically tabletop games that have a lot of math underneath of them. And it is a lot like Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know if anybody's ever played Dungeons and Dragons, but basically you get presented a scenario and led through a pathway. Uh, so the scenario is there's an outbreak along the border. Uh, that outbreak does X, Y, and Z, and we include misinformation in that group. And why do we have these games? We bring in politicians and scientists and public health officials to play the game. And we did that back in January, actually. Um, and we're gonna do that again coming up soon. And it's actually gonna be in part of that CDC grant that I mentioned. And it's um, what we found is that by playing a game, people understand or can better under can better identify when misinformation happens and how to compete it or to thwart it. Um, and the other thing that we learned was that people don't talk together, right? Talk to each other. So the politician might say one thing and the public health department might say the, a different thing based on the same information. Um, and letting that play out in a game, which is basically a human simulation, stops that misinformation from happening so that they can get a coordinated uh, response. But to your point, that was my little story. Uh, yes, we definitely understand that communication is a, is a big deal. Um, and misinformation is another one. The politics, though, I think is going to be the harder nut to crack. But happy to have engage others if they to have any other ideas on that. Thank you. Um, Peter Gorovich, you have a question? You're on mute. Peter. Yes, thank you. That was really very fascinating. I enjoyed listening to that a great deal. And my question actually follows on what Joel just asked you and the comment that you made, because you ended with a very powerful comment about its inequality that is producing these very different results socially. And at the same time, so I guess my question is that, you know, politicians face choices. They have to, money goes to X, it can't go to Y. And so what advice would you give, uh, you know, if you want to improve people's general health conditions, that's one avenue. Yeah, on the other hand, if you want to save lives with vaccines, that's a different one. And, you know, I mean, one of them is operating at in the medical research area to reduce fatality by improving the quality of medicine. And the other one is trying to reduce fatalities and disease by improving the conditions of people's lives and the quality of the medical care their access to medical care as they've been growing up and moving into it. So those are quite, to me, they're very different. They they perfectly exemplify what you were talking about, the tension between the politicians face with different pressures. Do we want more research? Do we want better medical care or better health care? And I, so I wonder what your thoughts are if you had, if you were called by one of the congressmen you talked to and asked, that, well, you know, what should I spend my money on? Should I approve? Should improve the access to medical care, or should I improve the vaccines and the other kind of research that's going on? Those are very different avenues. I wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's a great question. And my thought is actually, it's pretty much borne out in evidence. If I had one dollar to spend from the government, I would put it in public health access uh, over and over and over, saves a lot more lives. Um, Research, interestingly, so I was involved in all these active trials that got out the vaccine, they got out all the treatments that I just talked about, et cetera. And those were uh, amazing. Uh, and I'll never, hopefully never have to do that again in my life. Um, but those were done mostly by private public partnerships. So yes, the US government put in a ton of money in it, but most of that was spurred through private. Um, so Paxlovid from Pfizer, the vaccine from Pfizer, Moderna, et cetera. And they made money off of it. It became a, a capitalistic um, thing. That's the society that we live in. But our government also needs to take care of all the people. So they will still make those vaccines and therapies. So this is my opinion. They'll still make those vaccines and therapies because there's money to be made there. There's no, be, there's no money to be made in public health. And I think that's where we fail 
um, on the government side, we need to have those infrastructures in, in there. So to your question, if I had a dollar, I would spend it on access and public health. Thank you. Very, very clear answer. Thank you. I agree with it. It's very clear. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Rick Boland has a question. Yeah, ba back in the old days, um, RSV was a uh, a minor virus infected newborns who had other problems, and and suddenly now, it's um, recommended that adults, particularly older adults, get vaccinated. D did the virus change, or has our perception of it changed? It's a good question. So there's two parts to it. One is that this is the first year we actually have a vaccine. <laughs> so we didn't have a vaccine for RSV before. And I can spend a whole nother interestingly or very mind numbingly lecture on why we didn't do it. But it was a funny, funny thing. Um, actually, I will just say that the same reason we have a COVID vaccine is the same reason we have an RSV vaccine. The structural uh, they were able to figure out a structure to put it together to make it immunogenic on both the COVID spike protein and RSV to be able to make it as a vaccine. So that, that was good. Uh, the second one is we've always had RSV uh, kill older folks. We just didn't have anything to do with it. We didn't have anything to be able to prevent it. Um, it was never, and it will never be as big as flu. Um, and that's the reason that we've always talked about it, but it was always underlying a lot of older people's deaths. Thank you. I'll, I'll take uh, uh, the prerogative of asking a couple of questions. Um, Davey, should monitoring of activities of new pandemic strains be geographically focused? For example, as I recall, one of the variants was um, hypothesized to come out of an immunosuppressed HIV population in South Africa. And therefore, should we be focusing some of our monitoring activities geographically or individually, for example, in our immunosuppressed populations or in geographies where we have a higher percentage of immunosuppressed populations where viruses and other agents potentially could proliferate more rapidly and more continuously to create more variants? Uh, yeah, I agree. We should do it. We don't do hardly much surveillance at all. This is the dirty secret of, the, of everything, is that we do a little bit of flu, we do some gonorrhea, but we don't do much else um, and it, we should do it really within all our public health systems and mostly within uh, the poorest and most vulnerable and uh, immunosuppressed would be high on that list. But in general, that's the dirty secret is that we just don't do it at all. It's just so, it's so little um, out there, and especially for new pathogens. So just to follow up on that, so are we continuing wastewater monitoring and will that continue and or increase to not only include COVID, but other potential agents? Uh, I hope so. Um, there's been a lot of, it, everybody wants to forget the pandemic, I guess. I'm going to get on a little soapbox. Not that I haven't been on a soapbox all the time, but um, everybody wants to forget the pandemic and it's still here. There's still virus running around and there's a whole bunch of other viruses out there. Um so we see this concerted effort to stop a lot of the things that we're doing. And surveillance is absolutely at the top of the list um, and wastewater detection. At the moment, we're still doing it. And we have the CDC grant and hopefully we'll continue that and that we're getting trying to get other uh, counties basically to do the same thing. Um, but I don't know where the funding is going to come from for that. I, I think that this is right on the top of the chopping block. Um, and I think the reason is one, we want to forget it. So the more we do surveillance is the more it reminds us of it. And I, I, I think it's just human nature, but that's neither here nor there. And and then third, I, UCSD publishes every day the number of patients hospitalized and dying uh, relate, and deaths related to COVID. So can you tell us what the typical patient who dies of of COVID or COVID in, in, in combination with other diseases is like? Are those patients with a, a host of other illnesses or just COVID? Uh, that's a good question. So there's usually three groups. So one group is people who haven't been vaccinated, older men who haven't been vaccinated. The other one is older people over 75, 85, 90, um, th those people definitely do not well do well with COVID despite lots of vaccinations and lots of treatments, um, unfortunately. And as I go, 
as we all go through life, we get older, it, COVID becomes sort of the, the last final con common denominator for a lot of people. And I, I think I can continue to see that. And then the other one are people who are on rituximab. If you knock out your B cells, um, those people do not do well, uh, or some other immunosuppressant along those lines. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, David Gus has a question. Thank David. you, this is a, yeah, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Um, <clears throat> I have sort of a specific question about RSV because I've seen a little bit of conflicting or at least I've interpreted as conflicting information about recommendations for who should get immunized. So on one hand, they talk about uh, recommending it for individuals over 60, but then I saw uh, a more specific recommendation for those over 60 who had other medical issues that might increase their risk for complications. So it's basically a blanket recommendation for everyone over 60 or something a little more selective. Uh, yeah, I, there's, there's the task force. There's, there's a whole bunch of different bodies that look at this, but I'll just give my opinion. So the data look very good for protection and safety. So if those are the case, I see no problem for everyone getting it over the age of 60. Um, so that would be how I would interpret that. The best benefit, and it was only benefit, safety was the same for everyone, but the benefit, of course, was highest for people who had other uh, comorbid conditions, even controlled high blood pressure. So if you look at the data, controlled high, just having hypertension, even if you are doing great on lisinopril, you still have a higher risk of having a problem with RSV. So I, I think just getting it, um, the safety is, is, is really good. Um, on the topic of vac vaccines and new vaccines, I saw that Novavax was just approved. Now, it's it's not an mRNA vaccine. Is there any reason if someone has not gotten the current mRNA booster um, from Moderna or Pfizer to get Novavax instead? Yeah, it's a great vaccine. It, I, I, I know all the drama and trauma that you had to get that vaccine out, but they've been playing with it for so long. But in the end, it is it is a very good vaccine. So it's a protein subunit vaccine that's boosted that has, I'm sorry, it has an adjuvant, It's uh, but it's a very good one. In fact, if you don't want to get your mRNA vaccine, it's okay to go get the Novavax um, instead of, uh, well, when they come out with a new booster, if that's how you want to get boosted. Um, so yeah, good vaccine. And why do people not want to get an mRNA vaccine? Uh, you know, everybody has their, I think it's just politicized for the most part. Okay. Right? Other There's than politics, so uh, politics okay. around. Okay. And, yeah. And um, given all the success with COVID vaccines, why do we not have an HIV vaccine? <laughs> yeah. So the reason we don't have an HIV vaccine is HIV is just so much more genetically diverse than COVID. So COVID is, you know, we have all these variants, alpha, beta, delta, blah, 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 Omicron, son of Omicron. Um, and yet we talk about all that, but the genetic diversity of COVID is super small compared to HIV. So having one vaccine to help with all of HIV is, a, is just really a, a big difference. The other one is HIV, the COVID vaccine does not prevent infection. You do, it does look like you have some prevention of infection around two months after you get your vaccine. So that that's good. But after that, getting into the third and fourth month, there's no real protection from the infection. There's protection from death and being sick. I kind of think of it as a race. So if you get vaccinated, you start at you know 10 to 20 feet ahead. And then when you get infected, you can get to the finish line before COVID really gets to you bad. Um, but you really need those immune responses uh, geared up ahead of time, but it doesn't prevent from the infection at the beginning. This is a super infectious virus. We have a, David, do you have another question or is that your hand from before? You're on mute. Okay. Um, um, and then I saw you have uh, projects regarding human milk and COVID. Can you explain the connection or what you've learned from those projects? Oh yeah, we just got a uh, we just got a paper accepted actually uh, for our inbox, um, and that, that's 
basically, okay, so we have a great, you know, world renowned human milk Institute, and they were willing to partner with us because the big question was out there was like, is breastfeeding safe? How are these things spread? These are RNA viruses. Well, COVID is an RNA virus. Mpox is a DNA virus. Is it getting into breast milk? Is it safe? So we did a bunch of studies there. Um, it is there. Um, and we found ways to uh, neutralize it so that it would protect. So a woman could pump, um, freeze, do one freeze thaw. Looks like it was pretty safe after that. So um, for Mpox. Um, so anyway, doing that science really can help answer a lot of questions that can hopefully help a lot of people. Was that true for COVID as well or just Mpox? Yeah, yeah, for COVID as well. We okay. did COVID a lot, a lot longer before. And then we're also doing a bunch of other detection stuff. So it's uh, uh, just getting those guidelines out there for people quickly um, is very helpful, I think. Great, great. Peter has another question. Yeah, I don't. I, I just wondering what could we do to protect the food supply without um, spreading too many antibiotics out there and ruining our health that way? In other words, could we save all those birds producing the eggs to keep our egg prices down? Or if we do that, do we wind up spreading too many antibiotics through the, you know, the food that we eat and stuff like that? Yeah, so the biggest consumer of antibiotics is our agriculture and, you know, our animal agriculture. Um, and that is where most of our resistance comes from. So we have to come up, I think in the end, it's gonna be that we're gonna have to tolerate um, smaller cows and smaller chickens and be able to do those agricultural service, you know, uh, production without as much antibiotics as we use. Um, smaller because more of them will die. In other words, by growing, we're using too many antibiotics to make them big. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That's what they do. It's actually yeah. not so much that it keeps them alive. It just makes them bigger. Big, right. So we got to tolerate smaller ones to preserve yep. our health. Okay. That's right. Good, um, Good luck. <laughs> uh, oh, um, it, in, in one of the uh, journals, there was a report of using CRISPR, one of the new molecular techniques, to um, insert a gene in chickens that would make them resistant to bird flu. Are you familiar with that research? Yep, yep. It does, it, does it work, or is it still in the pre pre uh, pre uh, you know implementation stage? Uh, no, they they used it in the siRNA side. That's how they got the idea, and it does have some protective effects. And now they're like, oh, we can just modify the chicken uh, in general and make it resistant. I don't know if it'll work because it goes back to the point that I want everybody to remember is that if it doesn't succeed at first trying to kill you, it will mutate. And getting around a few genes for mutations is actually pretty easy to do um, for a virus, um, especially for an influenza virus. So I don't think that's going to really help so much with the chickens. The other thing, I, I, I guess I can't stress this enough, is that yeah, I worry about my feathered friends, but I'm really worried about my hairy friends. The mammals is where it's really kind of come to get us. Um, as soon as flu figures out how to infect uh, mammals, and it has in seals and minks and transmitted among them. We have a bunch of dead seals out in Peru, and that's that scares the crap out of me because once it figures us out, we're all on the um, smorgasbord. Mm. Um, let's and try to end on a positive. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Let's try to end on a positive note. Okay. Okay. Did you get the Hillcrest space and the, all the building that's going on in Hillcrest? Do you do you have additional clinical space that would be capable of handling pandemic patients, or is that still to be negotiated? We don't. We don't have that space. That is what I want. I, I really, and the Navy doesn't have this space. Uh, we have a little bit that's left over from the Miramar station, but that is not. That, that was pretty makeshift. We just put that together. Um, we really need high containment facilities. So when somebody comes in with, influ with uh, bird flu or Ebola, that we have the ability to contain them and to take care of them, et cetera. We do not have that now. Is this a UCOP issue? Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, UCOP would could get involved in funding it at one or two of the UCs rather than each UC trying to find philanthropic or other dollars on their own to create it. Yeah, you, you we have talked to UCOP and they haven't they haven't coughed any of this up. Uh, they 
pun intended, they do, they keep pointing to the government. And I, I th actually think that the, it'll end up being the military will fund us for this. They can't do it on their own. They mm -hmm. also have, they no longer have as much infectious disease physicians as they used to. In fact, they're almost all gone now in the military. Um, they're contracting some out, but so the overall capacity to deal with infectious threats is pretty much gone in the military at the moment um, on this scale. And I think that that means they're probably going to outsource us to academics. And that's, I think that's where we can get in line, hopefully. Well, that, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Other questions or comments? Oh, Dr. Davey? Hey. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, address, you know, this misinformation and the reason why uh, maybe the public is um, uh, hesitant about, you know, uh, vaccinations or COVID is, um, you know, when, like you, uh, elicit the, the major groups of, uh, of uh, COVID infections, um, but then when the, um, pretty much the medical system was stressing that everybody, infants, children, everybody had to have a vaccine, and then you hear, then you get vaccines that don't protect, don't prevent infections, how would the public have any trust with the medical systems when everything was laid out that way? I mean, I don't, I don't have much trust that much anymore either. So how, why would the, the public trust anymore? Well, it's mostly because it depends on where you get, well, okay, I'll back up. It really kind of depends on where you get your information. Um, and we've done a lot of really good uh deep dives into this. So if you watch MSNBC, if you watch Fox, if you watch local news, you will get different messages. And it doesn't happen to be just with vaccine. It's often with lots of different health-related conditions. Um, the, the vaccine specifically was a boiling point for this. Um, and the, the different communication styles and messages that were put out um, weren't usually on the healthcare side, it was on the politician and the public health side, which were political. So almost every, I'm sorry, every public health agency, I'm gonna get on this soapbox again, every public health agency in the United States is political. It is run through a political part, usually through a county. Our uh, health department is directly reportable to our county supervisors. And up until just a few years ago, they were all Republican, for uh, example, versus if you go to L.A., they're all uh, Democrat. And they approached pandemics in a very different uh, response. But they were the ones that were always on the news. Um, yeah, but was, so, uh, was yeah, sorry, so, sorry to interrupt, but wasn't the CDC, um, uh, the public health um, departments throughout most of the, um, the counties, pushing that everybody needs to get the vaccine because it's going to pre prevent you from getting infected. So um, the, uh, was it inappropriate uh, to, nope. for them so to good, all do good, that? Good, good, que it? good question. Nobody ever said, despite, despite you hearing this, nobody on the health side ever said that this vaccine would prevent infection. That was, that was not how the studies were done. That was not how it was messaged. Well, it was 97%. Efficacy, the New England Journal. 97% 97 efficacy, efficacy right. to keep you from dying, not no, preventing no, 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 infection. No, no. Those are I different things. Well, I understand, but you know, the, the push was really, no, you don't need to worry. Once you get the vaccine, you are not going to get infected. That's what Fauci said. So if the, the, that, those voices were out there very strong, let alone nobody. But, but, could. but, 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 but you, you raise a good point. Let me just break this down. You sure. said preventing infection. That was not what it is, but that's what you heard. That's okay. That's what you heard. But that's that's the misinformation part. We have to do a better job of saying why exactly did Fauci, what the science is. Go ahead. Right, but why did Fauci um, um, air that misinformation? I mean, why, he didn't, why did all these he, he, he did, I mean, I'm not going to defend Fauci on all sorts of things, but he never said that it prevented infection. He said that it was 97% effective to keep you from dying. No, no, no. He said, once you get it, you're going to be okay. So I've heard him. But I mean, these voices were everywhere. So sadly to say, misinformation 
through his lockdown, just think how many, how many um, a, a poverty, a, let alone the world. I mean, kids in Uganda couldn't go to school. I mean, horrible. But I appreciate your I, I presentation. Don't, don't. Thank, Thank you so for much. your question, James, and, and a lively yeah. discussion. Thank you so we much. appreciate it. Yes, yes, yes. Any other questions? Peter, you have another question? You're on mute, Peter. It's not, a, it's not a question. It's a comment on the previous exchange, which I'm a political scientist. I'm not a doctor, as many of you know. And so what I fascinated me is the politics of things like information misunderstandings. That's a politics to me. I think I agree with Davey on this. You, James and Davey had very different interpretations of what was being said. They and so and the public hears very different things on what's being said. So why should we be surprised that the public is confused? We know from lots of research on communication that when experts disagree, the public is very confused and doesn't know what to believe about Absolutely. any topic, not just medicine. Yeah. It doesn't matter yeah. what the topic is. And so you know, should you have pure water? Should you have chlorinated water? Any topic that's out there. From policy to inflation, whatever whatever explanation is out there, if the experts disagree, the public is very confused. So that solutions, I mean, we, that were discussed earlier, experiments where you're bringing people together and doing research on how are they going to communicate better. I'm sorry, I I regard uh, I personally regard that as naive. That's not going to get us anywhere, because the more difficult problem is is uh, why are such different opinions being transmitted by the big structures out there and why are why are people attached to different people they believe in people well i tend my father was a microbiologist so i tend to believe all of you because i believed him <laughs> and but i'm not most people aren't so fortunate as to have friends and colleagues who have that much information most people don't have that so we shouldn't be surprised that people are confused. We shouldn't be surprised by this the difference of opinion on what was being said, but it has tremendous implications for the issue of how are you going to stop that? Because getting people to sit around and talk to each other and having better methods of communication, that's not going to solve it because the problem has to do with who's out there pushing different interpretations and who's trying to confuse the public or not confuse the public or saying different kind of things. I think Bobby Kennedy is out to lunch as an anti-vaxxer, but I've talked to people who think, oh, he's a great alternative. So Except for that's the problem is you could only, um, anybody who had questioned, you couldn't, you, they were, you were canceled. So there really wasn't debate. You couldn't have a debate. Um, and that's just how, how it was. And it still is that way, sadly to say, but thank you so much. I, Rick Boland has another question. Yeah. Um, Davey, maybe you got into this and I missed it, you know, earlier, but um, historically, the uh, seasonal flu came largely from China, where there were farms in which people and pigs and chickens were all next to one another. Is the same thing happening with the avian flu? Is it is it is it um, uh, developing in a similar model? It started off developing in that model. Um, it. So Southeast Asia is where it always comes out. Um, and that's the reason. <laughs> so when we used to make flu by eggs um, and we'd always go figure out what flu might circulate there. And then that's how we'd go make, make our eggs so we could make our vaccine later. Uh, super interesting. Uh, but now the cat is out of the bag, uh, so to speak. And it's already circulating so widely, it, widely that uh, it's evolving elsewhere. So that, that, doesn't hold for avian flu at the moment, but it did start there. That's when they killed all, you know, I don't remember if you, they killed all these chickens in Hong Kong and everything trying to suppress it. Yeah, that was where they found it because that was where the surveillance done. Back, back to Dr. Parker's uh, question is that very little surveillance is done outside flu. And it was only done in Southeast Asia and that's how it was picked up at the beginning. Uh, but other note, uh, swine flu actually happened uh, here in San Diego, it came across the border from Mexico, and we picked it up first back in 2010. So it doesn't always happen to always have to happen um, in Southeast Asia. Okay. Any further questions or comments? If not, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davy Smith, and thank you everyone for your excellent questions and discussion. Yeah. Loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.